Hi guys, and welcome back to my Scary Movie Month movie reviews. Last week we reviewed Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds, and this week I'm going to review the original Halloween from the Halloween series, directed by John Carpenter from 1978. The first thing I want to talk about is the opening credits. It's this really slow, creeping zoom into a flickering jack-o'-lantern, and this really uncomfortable, high-pitched piano music is playing. And that music is the theme music to the Halloween movie, and that is what I believe is the most iconic part of this movie. And you can recognize a piece of music anywhere, and it's basically the only song they use throughout the movie, just different parts of it. And they use it kind of as a, as a cue to when something scary is going to happen. You start to hear the music play, so you automatically associate it with the scariest parts of the movie. And I had talked about before how, in my opinion, it is important for a horror movie to have something iconic about it in order for it to be memorable and become a classic. After the opening credits, we are introduced to our antagonist, who is Michael Myers. And in the very first scene of the movie, we witness a murder happen uh, by Michael, who is a kid, a, a very small child at this point. And we see the murder through his eyes. Uh, it's on Halloween night, and he's wearing a clown costume. And we watch from his point of view as he walks into his sister's room, who has just slept with her boyfriend, and he stabs her to death. So one of our other questions is who or what is the antagonist and why is the antagonist scary? And like I said, our antagonist is Michael Myers, a murderer with no empathy, uh, no feeling, uh, no emotion, and he wears a creepy, pale-faced, human face mask with no emotion, uh, just as a symbol, an outward symbol of um, his inside uh, emptiness. And I think that one major reason this movie is scary and that the antagonist is scary is that it is based around the holiday of Halloween and that uh, the idea that Michael Myers strikes on Halloween because Halloween is a scary holiday to begin with and it's creepy and you're out there trick-or-treating or partying or whatever you do and you will think about this movie and the possibility of a murderer coming after you on this holiday. So I think it was a good idea to have him strike only on Halloween uh, because people are already on edge anyway on that holiday and after they see this movie they will they will think about it and be frightened on that day. So we learn a lot about Michael's character through dialogue with his psychiatrist, Dr. Loomis. And in the beginning of the movie, Dr. Loomis refers to Michael as an it rather than a he. Uh, so you, you automatically get a sense of how Dr. Loomis feels about Michael. And he says that for the first eight years of Michael being his patient, he tried to reach out to him as a human and kind of see if there's any you know hope for salvation. But then he says for the next seven years, of working with Michael, he decides that he's going to put all his power into keeping Michael locked up and make sure he's never released because he learns that behind Michael's black eyes is just pure evil and there's just no hope of reaching him at all and he's just going to cause destruction. So it is Dr. Loomis's job to keep Michael uh, at bay the entire movie and in the beginning, when we skip forward uh, to the future, when Michael is 23, uh, Dr. Loomis and a nurse are driving up to a mental hospital and they realize that several of the patients have escaped, including Michael, who steals their car and drives off. And Dr. Loomis immediately realizes that he is going back to his old neighborhood to possibly cause some more destruction. If you also noticed, in the credits, uh, they credit Michael as a kid, the actor who plays him, Michael, as a 23-year-old, and then Michael when he has his mask on. And they, they call his character the shape. So there's definitely some intention of making Michael seem less than human or, or more than human, or at least something else, something outside of the human realm. And Dr. Loomis, who is a doctor, a psychiatrist, hints several times at believing in this like slightly supernatural idea that, that Michael is evil and he's uh, stronger than human. So we're introduced to Michael's character right away, and then when we flash forward to the future, uh, we meet our protagonist slash heroine. Her name is Laurie Strode and she's played by Jamie Lee Curtis, who it's crazy, she's so young in that movie. So Laurie's character, she's a really good student, she's smart, and as a result she kind of has no social life, uh, no boyfriend, uh, she's kind of a bookworm, and she's extremely responsible and observant, and that is a key point in many horror movies. In these stories, there's usually an evil force that comes into this universe and, and attacks people to teach them a lesson about being self-absorbed, unobservant, having bad morals or values, and Lori is kind of the opposite of that. And she's the only one who notices that Michael has returned to the neighborhood, and she's the one who starts seeing him uh, throughout the movie, and she's the only one who notices him, and she's the only one who's frightened and takes precaution. And then we have Lori's two 
I'm gonna say best friends, but they don't seem to be very nice to Lori throughout the movie. Um, but her two friends, Annie and Linda, are the opposite of Lori, and they are the classic kind of characters in horror movies. They are self-absorbed, uh, they are kind of irresponsible, boy-crazy airheads, and when Lori starts to see Michael Myers appear in the neighborhood, she tells them that she sees him and they don't believe her, and they kind of brush it off because they're too concerned with prom and cheerleading and their boyfriends that they're going to see that night. So after we meet Lori, we see that it's Halloween night again, and she will be babysitting as well as her friends Annie and Linda. And Annie and Linda have been talking about prom, and they've been making plans to see their boyfriends that night after babysitting, and they kind of make fun of Lori for having no social life, and they're joking about getting her boyfriend so that she can go to prom. And then the next murder that happens in the movie doesn't happen until 54 minutes into the movie. So you have this first murder in the beginning of the movie, you see it through the point of view of the killer, and then for 54 minutes there are no other murders. And so you're just waiting the entire time and you know what's going to happen, um, and it doesn't happen for that long. And so after the girls are babysitting, uh, one by one Michael starts to attack them. And that brings us to our next question, which is what stylistic choices do the filmmakers use to enhance the scariness of the movie. And one of the major unique choices that this film uh, chose to do is to show several shots to the point of view of the murderer. And I was, I was talking to my friends about this and I was trying to say, why is that perhaps scarier than being with the victim and seeing them creep around and look for the killer? Why would it be scarier to be from the killer's point of view or be right next to the killer? And I think part of it is the proximity. like you're right there with the killer and you almost feel what the killer is thinking. And you can see as the victim has no idea uh, what to expect, they have no idea that there's a murderer around the corner watching them from the bushes, where normally you would know what to expect and you'd be waiting for it. Now you're with the killer and you don't know what kind of decisions they're going to be making. And one major point is that you won't look away from the screen. Personally, like if I'm watching a movie and somebody is expecting a killer to pop out of the bushes and they have a flashlight and they're walking through the woods, I might close my eyes or I might get scared and I don't want to see the person pop out. But when you're front, you're with the killer, you know like nothing's going to pop out and scare you. Uh, instead, you have to keep watching because it's almost like you want to warn the victim. Like you're watching the killer get closer and closer and the victim has no idea. And I think that also just kind of enhances the idea of people being unobservant or having no idea what's going on um, because everyone's kind of an idiot except for Lori. And they never see it coming, they never expect it. And they're so distracted by um, just goofing around and smoking cigarettes and um, being crazy teenagers that they don't even know what's happening around them and they don't know that they're about to die. Whereas Lori is the only one who ends up fighting back with Michael because she sees him coming and she, she knows that he's coming. When he attacks her, she attacks back. And I don't think it's an accident that Lori is the virtuous character in this movie and she's the one who ends up surviving. So not only do they use those kind of point of view shots to make the movie scarier, but they also obscure Michael's character. Whenever we're looking at him and not from his point of view, he's either in shadows or the cuts are really fast. We never get a really clear shot of him. Um, in the beginning, they don't even, they crop out his head most of the time. It's either from behind or it's cut right here when he's walking uh, specifically in the playground. Um, to the little boy's school where the little boy that Lori babysits. And then later you see him from really far away, you see him with a shadow on his face when he's driving, and then even during the murders, it's not very gory. It's, um, you know, a lot of it is blocked by shadow, a lot of it is, you know, blocked by the camera angles. And a reason that technique makes things scarier is that it leaves, you know, it leaves room for the imagination. And so each individual viewer of the movie can fill in those blanks with what is most scary to them and it makes it more personalized. I recently watched a movie called Sinister, and they use a lot of methods of just showing very disturbing imagery. And it's gross and it's scary, but the problem with that is that it might not be the most disturbing thing to me personally. And by obscuring some things and not showing every detail of what's scary, you allow people to to personalize it and to you know, to add their own nightmares to the movie. And that is what makes it so terrifying and that's what's so awesome about this movie. They leave a lot to the imagination and they make you, they put you with the killer. They put you right next to the killer. And you, it enhances the suspense by like a million times because you're watching him walk up to the victim and then stab them. You're seeing it the entire time. You're anticipating what's happening every moment. And this is what we talked about last time, does the movie rely more on suspense or on shock? 
And this definitely relies on suspense because you know what's happening every single time that it happens. There is no real surprises, uh, but you you find yourself hoping that what you think is going to happen will not happen and that somehow this person will survive. And even the music, I was I noticed that the scary music, they always play when a murder is about to happen or something scary is about to happen, but they start to play it before it even happens, so you get a warning that it's about to happen. The first time Lori notices that Michael Myers is in the neighborhood, she's sitting in her classroom and she looks out the window and he's standing by his car. But before she even sees him, the scary music starts to play. So you as an audience member know something's coming before Lori does. And as an audience member, knowing, knowing something that the victim doesn't know makes things so scary because you can't do anything about it, you can't warn them. And a lot of times in scary movies, you're you're with the victim and you know exactly what they know and it's it's a different feeling and it's a different type of scary and so I just really appreciated the way that Halloween interacts with its audience and that you feel that you have more information than the characters in the movie have. And so in the final scene of the movie, Michael Myers attacks Lori. She's in the closet and he's breaking through the door and he's trying to stab her. He actually scratches her shoulder with a knife and she takes a hanger and she stabs him in the eye. And then she thinks everything is fine, and Michael is like passed out. She, this actually happens twice uh, after she, I think she stabs him when she's on the couch, and then later she pokes him in the eye of the hanger, but he just doesn't seem to die. And when she thinks everything's okay, um, she's in the foreground and he's in the background, similar to the shot in Birds uh, when the birds start landing on the jungle gym. And we can see it as an audience happening behind the main character, but she can't see it at all. And so it was similar to that where Lori's sitting there, and then we see in the background Michael sit up and he's still alive. And so then Dr. Loomis comes in and he shoots Michael like six times and we're sure he's dead and he falls out a window and lands on the ground. And then in the end of the movie, Dr. Loomis looks out the window and Michael is gone. And this is my, I'm getting chills right now talking about it, but this is my, this is, it's the last part of the movie but it's my favorite part. All it does is cut to several shots throughout the neighborhood and the sound of Michael's breathing gets louder and louder. And throughout the movie, whenever you, they would do a point of view shot of Michael, they, you could hear him breathing through his mask, that kind of like muffled breathing noise. And then now in the end of the movie, Michael is nowhere to be found, but we can hear his breathing everywhere. And it kind of suggests that Michael is everywhere. And to me, in that final scene, you kind of see that Michael has transcended him being a human, and he is now just an evil force uh, that is unstoppable, and he is everywhere. And I... I mean, obviously there are sequels, and he is still in a human form, but it just kind of shows that he's unstoppable at this point and that it is not as simple as destroying his body. Uh, it's going to be more complicated than that. And I don't know, I love the last scene. I think this movie is great. I think Michael Myers is a terrifying murderer and a great monster and he is the boogeyman. So please tell me your thoughts of this movie in the comments below. Uh, if you haven't seen it, go see it. Next week we're going to be watching The Thing from 1982, which is also directed by John Carpenter. And it's really fun to watch movies directed by the same person and see if you can see if they have a style or not. So please watch this movie, and if you want, watch Halloween also and see if you can compare the two. I can't wait to read your comments and your thoughts on this movie, uh, because it is one of my favorites. And please go watch The Thing. It is on Instant Watch on Netflix, so if you don't have another way of getting it, this is an easy way if you have Netflix just to watch it on Instant Stream. Uh, the Thing, make sure you're watching the one from 1982. There are two other movies called The Thing um, from different eras. Uh, there's one that just came out last year in 2011. Uh, so make sure you're watching the 1982 version. Uh, thank you guys so much for watching. Have a very spooky October month, and I will see you next week. Hi, Dotev. Um, this is my review for Halloween. Halloween is a very scary classic movie. It's actually one of my favorites. I always found it very creepy. Uh, Michael Meyer, who is, um, I believe, the villain, he's very scary. He's a, It's really a classic movie that really gets you in the mood to be scared if you want to be scared. So that's my review. I love your channel, and I hope you use this. Okay, bye!